Hello there, this is Chris Anderson. Welcome to the TED interview. And today, a bonus episode that's a little different. This is a live recording that took place a couple weeks ago in Bath, England. As you may have heard in our last episode, TED has recently launched a climate initiative called Countdown, uh, probably the most ambitious effort TED's ever undertaken, actually. So this is a discussion about that initiative with an amazing man who's playing a key role in it. His name is Tom Rivet Karnak, who worked alongside Christiana Figueres, our guest in that last episode, to architect the Paris Climate Agreement. Essentially, this is Tom and I interviewing each other, me for the TED interview and him for his podcast, Outrage and Optimism. Tom's insights on climate are both remarkable and inspiring. When you spend time with him, you come to believe that far from being powerless to act on climate, there really is something each of us can do, and that collectively, that could make a truly meaningful difference in our response to this crisis. And yes, it is a crisis. To any of you on the right, rolling your eyes, this isn't about partisanship, it really isn't. It's about science. The big picture of what's coming to us if we don't act is extremely clear and extremely concerning. So, thank goodness for people like Tom. And without further ado, let's roll this. So, <laughs> what you're about to hear is, um, is the first public conversation um, about an initiative that Tom and I are working on, um, where we're, we're trying to do something about the climate issue. Um, we announced something last week. Um, this, is, this is the first time we've, we've spoken about it publicly. Um, I will say that you're, you're looking at here one of the uh, absolute heroes of the climate movement. Um, you know, the, the, the Paris Agreement, we'll be talking about it in a bit. But uh, what happened there was transformative for the world's efforts. And, uh, and this man, with, with, with his partner, Christiana Figueres, were, were absolutely key to, um, to making that happen. And so I feel so lucky, Tom, to be, uh, to be working with you. Why don't we just get, um, get a show of hands, actually, first? Like, on, just on the climate issue. Um, worried about it? Not worried about it. There's your choice. Who, 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 <laughs> who, who, who's, who's basically uh, not, not worried about this issue? Wow. No, seriously, to be brave. So, no? who's, who's worried about this issue? Okay, I mean, that's, there might be a few abstainers in there, but it's basically like 98%. But it's, it's worth noting that would not have been the case a very few number of years ago, so no, even amongst a group like this. So we're, we're, we're recording yeah. this for um, our podcast with an S. We both have right. them. This may appear on, on, uh, on both of them. Um, and so, for those not here, not literally, the, look like the whole room put up their hand as, as a cause of worry. How, how should we think about climate, Tom? Well, it's, it's a very good question, how should we think about it? Because it's deceptively simple and very complicated. And I would argue that we've kind of never really worked out how to think about climate change in a manner that incorporates the scale of it, the relevance of it to our lives, and how we take action. So on one level, of course, climate change is about the fact that we are loading the atmosphere with greenhouse gases, and that's making the planet warmer, and we need to stop. So at its most basic level, you know, Greta's message, unite behind the science, that's very powerful, that kind of cuts through. But it's also the impacts of that and the response to that is kind of complicated. I mean, one thing that I think is a, an obvious but interesting insight is nobody's trying to heat the climate. It's a kind of outcome of the way we all live. And there's nobody in the world that is deliberately trying to warm the climate, which is a really interesting thought. The fact that we haven't dealt with it is a crisis of our ability to cooperate. And that's the piece we have to improve. We can kind of point fingers at people who should do, be doing more, et cetera, et cetera. But within that narrative, there's various different streams that kind of land with different people. There's a massive risk narrative. You know, we are, in the next 10 years, cons potentially, I would argue, going to have a bigger impact on the future of the world than any generation that has lived before. That's kind of a lot, right, for us to get our minds around, particularly when it's difficult to know what to do as a result of that information. But there's also a big opportunity strand. I mean, I believe, and many people increasingly believe, 
that the world is going to be vastly improved by our collective response to this. And the fact that we have to finally get our act together to cooperate and work together and improve the world will actually lead to a much better world. And the final piece I'd refer to is there's a massive justice strand as well. Climate change is fundamentally unfair. And it's unfair because the people who are most impacted are the people who've done the least to cause it. It's geographically unfair. It's generationally unfair. And I think that, in a way, as we think about it, that's one of the richest veins that taps into the human spirit. You know, our, our attraction to justice is fundamental. And to me, that's, that's a useful sort of beginning to frame the conversation around those three, those three strands. In a way, that's one of the big things that's happened in the last year is that, is that Greta and others have really poked that sense of injustice. Absolutely. And um, in addition to all the people we've seen on the streets, there's been this extraordinary explosion in uh, probably many adult brains that says, boy, she has a point. They have a point. And this is deeply unfair. Maybe we need to raise our game. And what's interesting about that is if you look back at history, the times when social justice, civil disobedience movements have been most effective or the only times they've been effective, have been the times when the, the people who are vulnerable rise up. Think about the civil rights movement, think about the end of colonialism, other things. It has to be the people who are most affected who take it upon themselves to rise up and do something about it. And that's what we're seeing now with the kids. So, Tom, you've been thinking about this for a long time, and especially this attempt to get global cooperation. <laughs> Tell us about Paris. What happened there? Why? Was that a big deal? So the world had tried for, for a long time to reach a global agreement on climate change, and it was extremely difficult. Um, it was extremely difficult because of this issue of fairness. Developing countries would say to the developed world, you caused this problem, and what's more, you said you'd sort it out. So go away and do something and get some momentum, and then come back and talk to us, and we'll think about a global deal together. And that was right, right? That was a logically consistent argument. But then developed countries would say, the world has changed. And actually now, many of the emissions come from India, come from China, come from other places. We need to come together. And the world kind of fought that out for, for years, really, between the two. What happened in Paris was that the risk got too great, and we flipped the way the agreement was structured. So rather than saying, everybody has to come with a predetermined commitment to do something specific, we said, we all have to collectively agree to where we get to in the end, by 2050, and every five years we'll come back to the table with as much as we can do that gets us on that trajectory. So it tried to flip it from a narrative of shared blame to a narrative of opportunity. The good element of that meant that an agreement was possible. The bad side was, how do we know it's enough, right? That mechanism has to work whereby countries come back every five years and get more and more ambitious, or the whole thing collapses. And the first test of that is next year. So viewed one way, an analogue would be, you know, you have, you have two people who are in violent disagreement. They can't get to an agreement. Um, and instead of getting to an agreement, what they agree to do is they just agree to go on a journey together. OK, we can't agree, but let's at least agree to go to therapy every week together. Right. It's, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, that's the or, sort of... Or you would say, you know, I really want to be healthy in a certain amount of time, and I've just got this target for the next month, and then I'll make another target for the next month. I mean, the process of, of getting there, I, I just remember at the time that it, like, there was a lot of pessimism going in that anything could um, come out of that agreement. And it was, you were right in the heart of it. It was extraordinarily intense. You, you told me a story earlier today that, that, that shocked me. That is just like it, it, t tell us that, that story. Is. It's just as a flavor of how high the stakes were there. Sure, so um, this is a story from the negotiations in Paris. And we were there for like a month. It was incredibly intense. And you know, the people who lived through those negotiations, it's, it's 18, 19 hours a day, it's two or three hours sleep for weeks on end, trying to reach these, these negotiations. And this was at the beginning of the second week. So we were maybe four or five days away from the Paris Agreement. And Christiana Figueres, the executive secretary and I, were working together in her office at about four o'clock in the morning. And the head of security came in, and he said, um, I'm, I'm really sorry, but we have found an explosive device. And we found it in the train station. This is two weeks after the Bataclan attacks where so many people were killed in Paris. 
Um, we found this device. It was in the train station. Uh, the train station would have been full of people. Um, we've destroyed it. We don't know if there's any more. We're pretty sure there's not because we've searched around. I mean, obviously, I still think about that moment almost every day. And Christiana and I sort of reflected on the consequence for humanity of leaving and of disbanding the conference. Because these things have a kind of momentum and a, and a tide to them. And we were pretty sure that if we left, we'd never get back to that point again. We were confident in the security forces. And we started using the train station ourselves. We gave up the diplomatic car, came through the train station, didn't tell a soul, didn't tell my wife, who's here somewhere. Um, and yeah, it was, it was a lot of pressure. That's an extraordinary story, Tom. It says a lot about you and Christiana and, and how, just how absolutely determined you were to make something happen here. So, wow. And I don't think that story has been widely known. I guess no. you, you've got a book coming. It might be in that. We right? have a book. It's in the book. So uh, that, was my, that was its trial run in public. So, so. <laughs> so so what happened since? Like, there, there, there was this eruption of... Uh, I mean, some people were cynical about it, but basically most people who knew the history of what had happened in these negotiations, understood the issue deeply, were thrilled, were celebrating that something big was, was, was done here. Um, talk about what's happened since. So, um, you know... December 2015 was this moment of international unity. 197 countries coming to a unanimous agreement. It had to be unanimous, right? Not a single dissenter in Paris was remarkable, right? And was hailed as this incredible diplomatic achievement. And, you know, we allowed ourselves to think, this is it, right? World's coming together, dealing with this thing. Six months later, Brexit. Five months after that, Trump. And the world began to go in these other different directions. You know, Bolsonaro got elected. And the whole thing began to sort of fray. Um, as the international, you know, multilateralism has kind of come off the boil a bit since then. The idea that countries can come together and collectively do big things is not as trendy as it was in 2015. So, on one level, it's been deeply disappointing. You know, emissions have gone up since Paris. We always knew that it was not going to be enough, but to not deliver it at that scale is, is heartbreaking, really. On another level, and this is one of the really interesting things about climate change, so the, the, the exponential curve of impact and risk is going up, but the exponential curve of solutions and mobilization is also going up. And we don't know which of those two curves is going to win. So the signal from Paris was remarkable in terms of the way that it reorganized business models. Economies were reorganized around it. The cost of wind and solar is now lower than fossil fuels in most economies around the world. Electric vehicles are doubling every two years. You know, there are these hopeful trends in the real economy, but we're still not getting on top of it and doing enough. And I think that's why you've seen the emergence of this civil disobedience and this real anger. There is real anger now about the fact that we're not dealing with this in a timely manner, and it's justified. And the sense in 2015 of hope and possibility is, has ebbed away a little bit. That can be good, it's got more of an edge to it, and I do think the implementation can go further and faster, but we're in a slightly different and more complicated world. Indeed. And despite seeing that happen, you and Christiana formed uh, this partnership called Global Optimism. Absolutely. Let's, yeah. let's talk about that word, optimism. Um, does that mean that like you wake up every morning feeling it's going to be okay? <laughs> that would be nice. Um, so I think one of the most interesting things about optimism is it's most relevant when the outlook is the darkest. Like if you look back at history, you find moments where optimism was held like a torch in the dark as this strategy for improving the future. You know, fight them on the beaches, I have a dream. This isn't like a soft you know, acquiescence to, oh, it'll probably be fine. It's like optimism is a strategy to drive ambition and to drive dedication towards something more positive. And we saw that in Paris, right? We learned on the road to Paris that if you believe something is possible and you can infect lots of people with that idea, then you can create a positive momentum towards something more hopeful. So I do feel optimistic in general, in humanity, in our ability to deal with this in a timely fashion. But I also think that optimism is our, is our most effective strategy to deal with this. 
Right. It's, it, that's, that's powerful to me. It's not, not to think of optimism as a, as a feeling, but, but as a stance. Yeah. It's, it's like... It's a way to do stuff. Yeah. Craig Venter once said on the TED stage, he didn't know whether the optimists or the pessimists were right. He knew that it was only the optimists who got anything done. Right, yeah. And, um, and I, you, yes, I mean... <laughs> So, 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 I mean, you need to at least believe that there is a possibility. You don't need to believe that it's likely or that it will happen yeah. necessarily. You need to believe that there is a pathway there. Yeah. And you, 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 you take the stance, to be, to be optimistic is just to take the stance, what better thing do we have to do than to roll up our sleeves and try and tackle this? And this is a tremendous privilege, right? We allow ourselves to feel powerless in the face of the scale of this problem. But the, you know... Future generations will look at this moment and think, my God, they lived at the fulcrum of these different futures. And they just kind of sat around saying, well, it's all a bit too big and we can't do anything about it. You know, I mean, it's ridiculous, right? You know, we all have much more power than we realize in our lives, in our communities to do stuff. And we may as well get on with it. We're not gonna, if it's not now, when's it going to be? It's, it's a very interesting psychological question of what is it that, that creates the most willingness to act? Yeah. Like it's... It feels like anger actually does play an important part of it. Anger and fear are important. They're, yeah. they're like we evolved them for a reason. They are our defense mechanism to say, look out, human. You need to act, and you need to act urgently. Yeah. But if that's the only thing you feel, you, you fall into despair and, and kind of cower as if you were dead and no, nothing happens. So it's, it's the, somehow we have to pull together r real, real anger, real urgency, and yes, no... Come on, yeah. let's do this. There actually is a way out here, yeah. maybe, if we, if we persuade each other to do the right things. Talk a bit more, Tom, just about, about the emissions pictures. You said that they're relentlessly rising, but it's, it's a complex picture. They're not rising in every country. Um, yeah. talk, talk about just the, glo the, the global drivers that are, in, in, are right now are driving those emissions up as, as, as it stands. Sure. So, you, you know, I mean... Emissions are a factor of economic activity of a certain type. So if you do stuff, you'll have emissions. Um, obviously, the economic trends over the last decades have been that we have outsourced much of our making of stuff to other countries. And largely as a result of that, but not exclusively, but largely what we've seen is a drop of emissions in developed countries and a rising, significant rising of emissions in manufacturing countries, China, India, not only them, Latin America and elsewhere. So we're now in this sort of situation where we have to collaborate with those countries to figure out how we can come to some global arrangement because they also, you know, want to develop. And that's something that we should applaud, the, the fact that they want to pull millions of people out of poverty and live a better life. And that requires sometimes combusting emissions for energy generation, although these days renewable energy is generally cheaper, cutting down trees, which is generally a bad idea anyway, mobile emission sources, and a range of other types of activities. So there's, there's a couple of things going on. One yeah. is that, is that the, what you're saying that Western countries, developed countries, have outsourced a lot of the manufacturing so that they have mainly increasingly sort of creative economies which are fundamentally able to dematerialize faster. Um, but, and the other key piece is, is just that there's a different history involved. Like if you, if you looked at... Um, emissions per capita, the, the global spread is, is astonishing. I mean, right. I, I, I'm not sure what the exact numbers are, but very roughly speaking, 20, uh, up to 20 times more in the West than in right. some developing countries. And, and so, if you look historically, it's even more. It, yeah. So, 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 there's, so that's, a, that's a fundamental injustice. So somehow the world has to... So it's, 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 it's literally ridiculous to expect that the country with, 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 say, you know, two or three or four tons of emissions per person should cut emissions when, when you've got this other country with 25 tons per person. I think, roughly speaking, in the West, tw each of us is responsible for at least 25-plus tons of emissions, of CO2-equivalent emissions. I mean, that's, that's an amazing... So, so, yes, that 25 has to come down. Yeah. It, we shouldn't be that surprised that the two or three or four tons per capita continues to rise a bit. I mean, at some point, we want a world where people are basically have, you know, this fairness and, and you know. So, so there has to be that 
equalization. So it's a very complicated picture to imagine how collectively we bring the, the whole number down. Are there options for developing countries just to, to develop in dramatically different ways than we developed in the West so that they can actually avoid ever going to the ridiculous levels that we oh, got to. Oh, hugely. And that has to be the way it happens, right? And in a way, many of those countries sort of missed out on the industrial opportunities of industrial development in the last industrial revolution. And, you know, the argument against the idea that poor people need coal in India is the fact that they don't want, to, they don't want their children to die by breathing polluted air. Um, it's a much more miserable existence to have that much more polluted environment. Um, and actually, they're going to get trapped in an outmoded model of development incredibly quickly. So what you're saying is true, but at the same time, we've left it so late that we now have this sort of emergency situation. Um, emissions, to keep us under 1.5 degrees of temperature rise, which is generally regarded as the point at which these really quite alarming natural feedback loops can kick in, um, is going to require a 7.5% reduction per year. That's, right? that's huge. Which is huge. That's huge. It's, in, it's beyond anything that humanity has come together and achieved before. So now we're going to figure out if we're serious about this or not. So basically that path is, over the next 10 years, we yeah. have to globally cut emissions in, in half. half, which means that in the West, more than half. Yeah. Um, and by 2040 or 2050 at the very latest, yeah. we need to get to net zero. Absolutely. Net zero means some combination of much lower emissions, but also some sequestration. Yeah. Hmm. So, Tom, <laughs> how do we get there? <laughs> so, well, so, I mean, there are options, right? I mean, it can seem you can look at this and think, well, it's all so large, it's all so remote. We are closer than we think to some of these tipping points. Tip, the positive tipping points that shift the economy in a positive way. And actually, we can accelerate them in the next 10 years faster than we could possibly imagine. We're closer to the end of the internal combustion engine than we realize. We're closer to a mass tree planting exercise globally beyond the scale of which we've ever seen than we realize. And more and more people are focusing on that. I mean, the paper that came out is somewhat disputed, but there was a paper that came out last year that pointed out that there is enough land around the world to plant somewhere in the order of a trillion trees. That is not covering land use for urban habitation and not land used for growing food um, and not wild land. And that would return the climate to something like the state it was in in the early 70s. And we could do that in the next 10 years with relatively small redirections of public money. Trillion's a big number. A trillion's <laughs> a really big, like a million is a big number. Imagine a million right. trees. Can you imagine planting a million trees? What would that take? A trillion is one million times Millions. a million. Right. So, I mean, it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's thrilling that it's possible, but somehow we have to find a whole new mindset right. of, of absolutely um, catalytic and just different scale action where humanity as a whole some, somehow has to, has to go for this. Well, this is where Ted comes in. Uh. <laughs> so I mean, the com the, well, <laughs> you know, the, 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 com the conversation we've been yeah. having, we've been having it, Ted, we've been having others, is, is like, is there, is there a role that, that we can play? I mean, my, and I know that all of us um, feel, I mean, we're certainly worried about it. We all feel powerless, right? Like, it's, it's, it's such a big problem. What on earth could you do? And um, um, so, so our, I mean, my own journey on this was, was I, I don't think we can do much. But on the other hand, we do have a platform out there yeah. that is, that is um, um, you know, regarded as a sort of non-partisan um, quest for just for, for, you know, for better thinking and so forth. Um, we have these incredible TEDx organizers all around the world. There's 4,000 the communities where there's, there's, a there's a group pulling people together and they, they want to make a difference in the world. And, and we have um, the ability to some extent to convene people, to, to call people, bring people together and say, you know, let's, let's think about yeah. this. And, and so the sinking horrible thought was, God, we ought to do something <laughs> with that. That's right. going to be really hard. Um, and, um, but that's where we've ended up, yeah. trying, trying to think about it. And um, so what happened was um, 
while these horrible thoughts were <laughs> going on, um, I met uh, a woman, Lindsay Levin, who works with Tom and Christiana and with another group called We Mean Business in a coalition called Future Stewards. Um, and, um, and we just ended up getting excited about... trying to partner and trying to build something here that was, a, that was a different, in a way, a different kind of response, not intended to displace or compete with anything else that was out there, but to find, arg arguably what Ted sometimes does is to find and amplify good ideas that someone has had and, uh, and make, just make them more visible in the world. So we, we started asking ourselves, could we, could we do that? Could we go out there? So many, there are so many heroic people who have been working in this space for years, sometimes decades, they actually have amazing ideas about what could be done. But some of those ideas don't have that much visibility. Um, so we started to ask ourselves, could, could, could we amplify those ideas and could we bring together some of the different groups that sometimes right now are in silos? Like the politicians have their discussion, business leaders have their discussion, you know, Environmental groups have their discussion, the activists have their discussion. There's, there's just not enough yeah. connection between them. And, and so the exciting conversation was what would happen if you could bring some of these groups together um, and um, amplify with, with, you know, imagine many other people around the world coming together looking and saying, come on, please, please do something good. We're ready to, to help and to further carry it on. Like, what, what could that look like? And Tom, you, you know, what was really exciting in the early discussions is that you, you gave some examples of how there, there actually might be these sort of um, amplifying effects of people elevating each other's ambition mm. in a way that could allow you to dream about something big. So talk, talk about that. Talk about... Um, B both the trees thing and, and the and the uh, and, and earlier end to the internal combustion engine and how the chances for those things happening um, at scale just might hmm. be increased if you could pull these groups together. Sure. So, and should we, should we just quickly introduce what countdown is so people know, and then we can talk about that as a specific element of it? What do you think? Right. Yeah. Let's do that. So yeah. This, right. yeah, yeah. Yeah. So what this led to was an initiative called Countdown, as in count down the emissions. People disagree on lots of things on climate. They disagree on timing and how. Everyone, every scientist, everyone who's serious about it knows that we have to count down an emissions number that's currently standing on 55 gigatons of CO2 equivalent that we are emitting every year to zero. Then that that everyone agrees on that. So that's what countdown is. And, um, and it was conceived as, yes, a central event next October, but amplified by hopefully millions of people around the world gathering in cities, companies, and schools, um, and bringing together these different groups of politicians, business leaders, investors, environmental groups, activists, and so forth. So, so what, what would be the use of that? How of that. could that actually lead to anything happening? Well, so, so I think there's two things I am really excited about, about this relationship we have with you and, and the fact that you've, you, you know, you've jumped into this complicated space, but you've jumped in with an unbelievable set of assets, and I think it's going to make an incredible difference. Um, the first is that the most interesting things in this space can't be done by any one type of stakeholder on their own. 
right? So for a long time, you've had like businesses make commitments to green their operations or green their supply chains. You've had cities make commitments to do certain things in their cities. But there's been relatively little like coming together and collaboration. And there's actually a very strange kind of global institutional gap for someone that can play that role as a convener. So we started to talk to Chris about the links that they have into all these different stakeholder groups. And we realized, you know, we can't do everything, but could we do a couple of really knockout things that would come out of this process to create countdown that would send a signal that we are closing the door on the past and embracing the future in specific ways? So for example, one of the things we're going to do is end the internal combustion engine by 2030, right? That's already happening by the normal processes of economic development. And left to its own device, it'll happen sometime in the early 2040s. Countries are making commitments, et cetera, et cetera. It's already in play, but it can't be the early 2040s. It needs to be the 2030s. So we're establishing a process to engage all the relevant stakeholders in different ways. And we can do it for two reasons. One is the political relationships that we have, and the other is the bottom-up nature of TED and YouTube. So YouTube are a partner in this initiative, and we've been speaking with school strikers and Greta and a range of others about being involved. Can we get young people to say, we will never buy an internal combustion engine? We think we probably could, right? That would send a massive market signal to the car producers that the future is, the past is gone and the future is arriving immediately. Can we also engage 15 of the largest car manufacturers and say, you need to bring your end date forward from 2036, 2037 to 2030 to completely shift your fleet to electric vehicles or zero emissions vehicles. At the same time, can we engage investors controlling 20 to $30 trillion of assets under management to say, we will either engage with those companies to help them transition or we're going to pull our capital. We'll also engage with thousands of cities to say, can you create a zero emissions zone inside your city by a certain day that sends another signal to that. Likewise to regions that set very significant regional policy and air quality policy. And then finally, through work we're doing with the national government here in the UK, who are hosting the climate negotiations, work with the G20 to actually bring a significant number of them forward. If you can do that and wrap that up in a package, it's not the only thing we need to do, but we really think that we would have a shot through this program of coming out of that progress saying, that's done. The internal combustion engine is done inside 10 years. Now, if we can do that, then we've come together as a society to do a massive thing. And that's what we're lacking at the moment, is the idea that we can do big things together. And that's really exciting. That's going to be a great world to live in. Don't you want to be part of the generation that does that, that ends the internal combustion engine, that plants a trillion trees, that changes the world in that way? Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> you can see why I, I like working with this man so much. I mean, it's, a, it's incredible. He said, we are going to end it. I, I think we're, we're going to do our damnedest to try and do that. And it's, 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 a, it's a daunting thing. But one, one thing that's really exciting is that the process of getting there actually makes a, a much better world, like cooler cities. Because right. you're talking, as part of... Um, the sort of massive shift to electrified transport, you're talking about bringing in all kinds of new models. It's not just going to be everyone driving in an electric car. Some of them, they'll start to drive themselves. You'll have um, a massive explosion of sort of ride-sharing services that hopefully are done. Public transport already. models, so, all sorts of... Yeah. 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 And so, so you, could, you could picture soon cities being much less dependent on the sort of noisy, stinky, dangerous cars sweeping through all the time to... Um, it's just a much better system where there's a lot more walking, there's a lot more cycling, there's, there's smart electric transport in there. And, uh, and it's, it, it's this, you know, sometimes, sometimes climate is framed as this, um, come on, humanity, let's find the strength to sacrifice for a right. sort of compromised, mediocre future, let go of our toys and our, you know, the things we like to play with because we need to do it for our kids and, you know, for the planet. It's actually not that. The, the same innovations that will solve the problem, will end up building a much, a much cooler yeah. future and also a, a, a greener planet. Talk about the... the um, you know, so, so it, overall, in this initiative, Captain, we're looking at five big areas. Um, power, transport, food, the built environment, and, and all of which are huge contributions to emissions. And by, by, by radical action in those, we can hopefully reduce emissions. That's still not going to be enough. We need to also start sequestering 
And, uh, and the single best way to do that, or the least, certainly the way that can pull in most support, there are technologies that might do that at some point, but the way that can pull in most support are, are using nature to do it. So it essentially means a massive increase in the amount of photosynthesis on the planet. Photosynthesis is a miracle. Photosynthesis loves carbon dioxide. It uses it. It, it is its food. It sucks it out of the atmosphere and creates oxygen and food, whatever. It's, 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 you know, so the, pl the plants of the planet, including of the ocean, could, could be our heroes here who actually help, help solve this problem. Talk, talk a bit about, more about that possibility and, and how these different stakeholders could combine to make it more possible to imagine an absolutely massive re-greening project. So, I mean, and this is in many ways the one I get most excited about, right? Because I think that it is the one that immediately touches everybody. The idea of living on a re-greened planet, you know? We, we live um, in many ways lives that are separated from the beauty of living in, an, in a very natural place. And we've become used to that. We've become used to ecological deserts. But we are now required as a result of this process and the situation that we found ourselves in to engage in this massive tree planting activity, restoration of land activity that will fundamentally change the, the, the look of the earth by the time, you know, by, the, by 2050. So we already see countries understanding this. Um, there are outliers like Brazil under the current administration, but the vast majority, and I just came back from the climate negotiations the day before yesterday, the vast majority of countries in Madrid negotiating this week understand that they need to double down on land restoration in a really big way and that there needs to be financial mechanisms to do that. But likewise, there are other levers to achieve that. And it doesn't have to be national governments. It can be regional governments. It can be corporate supply chains. It can be cities that would green their environment. It can be individual citizens. I mean, one of the great examples of working with you was uh, working with Ted and our partners, YouTube, there was a discussion about how the YouTube platform could be used to accelerate massive tree planting in, a, in, rapid, in rapid time. And all these YouTube creators that I had never heard of, and this guy called Mr. Beast, who has 35 million followers, just started this platform to say, I'm going to plant 20 million trees in two months. And he did it in like six weeks. There's a, there's a human scale engagement that's incredibly empowering and exciting that I think through this partnership and through this mass citizen engagement process that we'll engage in through TED uh, will be transformative. I mean, a trillion trees, I think, more than restores everything that's been lost through deforestation in the last 20, 30 years. It's about half the trees cut down since the dawn of agriculture. So think about that. I mean, that, that's that. And the, the, the amazing yeah. thing is that there is room on it for the planet. That yeah. the, uh, urbanization, even though population is continuing to grow, probably grow to 10 billion or maybe a bit more, but because of the process of, of urbanization globally, humans' actual footprint on the planet is, is somewhat shrinking. I mean, mm. there's actually land is becoming available that was used as sort of low-grade agricultural land or whatever. It's becoming available. Yeah. Um, so there, 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 this actually is a real possibility. And there's, there's actually a lot that could happen in, in the ocean as well. There's, there's possibilities for, like, kelp. It, you can have giant kelp forests that they're reasonably cost-effective to seed, and, you know, they can absorb a huge amount of carbon as, as well. Mm. So, I mean, I, I, I hope that... The, the hope, I guess, Tom, is that, is that everyone raises everyone else's game. Yeah. That, that, what, that governments start to compete, compete with each other um, about how, how many trees that they can plant. Yeah. Um, and that citizens get in on the act. And maybe, you know, it's, you could imagine really, really uh, new creative ideas for people's lawns. Lawns right now are a kind of, they're green, but they're not as green as they could be. They don't. You know, they don't absorb that much carbon. They, they, there's a possible rewilding movement that you could, uh, you could imagine where people... I, I actually would rather have like a little mini rainforest of sorts in my, in my, right. in my <laughs> garden. Thank you very much and, and feel proud about it. There's some biodiversity it. in it. Uh, bio yeah. exa ex exactly. So th there's, there's at every scale yeah. on this chain, you, you can imagine exciting things happen. Well, why don't you talk about 10, 10, 2020 as a moment for that? Right. So, so, so we're planning, you know, this 
this event in, in Bergen, Norway, where a thousand of hopefully the big decision makers will come along with um, you know, storytellers. We've got support from a, a pretty interesting group of names from Hollywood and, and um, you know, the U YouTubers and so forth. So, so a, an odd mix of people in, in Bergen, Norway, but um, amplified by, by people all around the world, and, and I hope here, here in Bath as well. Um, we, have, we have a partnership with um, two, two, at least two um, organizations of, of city mayors, with C40 and the Global Covenant of Mayors. There are a lot of mayors who really want things to happen in their, in their cities that they can be proud of. They need political support. They need to see signs that citizens will come out. So we're encouraging our TEDx organizers to connect with those mayors and then to plan for giant event in their city um, to, to, to be part of this movement, to, to prepare in the months leading up to it um, what stories and things can be worked on, stories that can be shared with the world. Of, we did this here, it's, it was inspiring, it actually worked, this is how we did it. Uh, to have that sharing of knowledge. All leading up to this day, which is the, fi like the final day of the conference, October 10th, 10, 10, 2020, which we would love to feel as like this giant day when the world comes together and just decides to act on, on climate. Um, and um, it's, you know, so, so I mean, a, a discussion I would love to have with, with people here is, I know so many people here are passionate about this. There's already so many great initiatives happening here. We, we would love to figure out how to connect you to that day. Um, and there's another specific way to connect to the day, which is around what companies do. Mm. We should probably talk about this, because you know, a lot of individuals feel powerless about what they can do. You know, people, everyone's trying to do their bit on it's composting, on using less plastic straws, or you know, what, whatever the story is. But there's, there's a key piece of power that you have, which arguably is, is um, underused right now, which is your power as a company employee. Um, we want to, through this Countdown initiative, connect people to others in their companies who are passionate on this issue and to start having what we hope are just constructive um, discussions with leadership. Many, many CEOs and C-suite are actually trying to figure out a good way forward on this issue. 20 or 30 motivated, organized employees in a company could have massive impact on those discussions and on those efforts of saying, no, we've got to do this seriously. Yes, I see that we've taken some decisions on our lights and whatever. What about our built environment and our buildings? What about our supply chains? What are we doing there? Can we join? There's a, there's a whole initiative called Science-Based Targets, which is part of Tom, the coalition that Tom's part of through an organization called the Carbon Disclosure Project that has worked out in, in, in amazing detail sector by sector, what is reasonable for companies to do if they want to be heroic, if they want to be part of the 1.5 degree ceiling process, mm -hmm. what they can do. So, so with a little bit of organization, a little bit of empowerment, education around the right way to think about what companies can do, we think, we hope, mm. we can um, encourage a lot of engagement in a lot of companies. And again, to have big company meetings during, during this week where companies can celebrate bold decisions, share that knowledge, and persuade others to, to come on board. Um, so I'm afraid that, you know, like that what TEDx's have done around the world has made us think that that could be further extended into, into company meetings. Yeah, I mean, I think it's one of the most inspiring elements of it, actually, because, you know, something can happen in Bergen, and there's often, you know, climate conferences on a big scale. But the fact that this can be driven into local communities, you know, we talked with the mayor of London. He said, well, every school in London should do one of these. And, you know, they might show a little bit of what happened in, London, in, in Bergen. And then after that, you know, the kids could give little TED Talks about what they can do on climate. This is the level at which we need to make this as every day as other parts of our lives, right? It needs to become an everyday thing that gets baked into the background of what we do and doesn't become something that we're afraid of or necessarily that we're inspired by, but it's just part of life. And that's how it will become meaningful and embedded. I also think the other interesting thing that TED can do is help people connect emotionally with this issue, right? Because I, I see people kind of go back and forth between this like gnawing feeling of like, oh my God, we're not gonna make it, and that real sense of anxiety. 
um, to a sense of denialism, to a sense of excitement, etc. And it's very difficult to be emotionally healthy in the face of this. But I think that through Ted in Bergen, we can actually bring some more depth and some more sophistication to the emotional response that people bring to that. Is that part of your vision for it as well? I mean, it, it is. It, it is. And, I, I, and some of that can come from, I don't know, some inspiring speaker giving us some language and framing for it. I think most of it will come yeah. actually just from people teaming up and doing something. I think, yeah. I think the, the feeling of... Feeling powerless is horrible. Yeah. And if you're just in the role of, of having to decide whether to be depressed or, or a little bit excited about the day's news, that, that's... Yeah, that's that's hard. But if you're in the trenches, if you're, actually, you know what? Okay, I figured out what I can do. There's a group of us here. We're going to do this, and we're going to know that if we're successful, we can actually share that knowledge with with others. Um, I, I I think I hope that that shifts things. I mean, Tom, I'm conscious, you know, in this whole discussion about there's probably people here thinking, who the hell do these guys think they are? That this is absurd. This is so. This is this is sounding ridiculously uh, grandiose or, or or whatever. And I I. I, I, I worry about that yeah. because, but, because, like, part of me thinks it is absurd and that we should just shut up and, and go away. But part of me thinks that the only, because of the scale of this issue, the only way you can, you can kind of talk seriously about something moving, is to aim big and to, to you know, to to try to change everyone's ambition level. It's not, like what, what Christiana and what, what you did at Paris that was so magical was to challenge people's assumptions that something was impossible. Um, Christiana's right. famous quote is, is what? The impossible well, is not, not a, a fact. fact. It's an attitude. It's an attitude. And so what that, what that meant was that if you could say to someone, the, you know, the people who you think won't come along for the ride, you might be wrong about. Their, their attitude is actually shifting. I've spoken to them, they're, they're changing. Now, now you change your mindset and you start thinking bigger, please, because we need you to. Um, that that becomes yeah. infectious, and so I, I kind of apologise almost for for some of the language of this. And yet I don't apologise because it seems to me it actually is the only way to do this is to say it's so exciting, Tom, to hear you say to me that a politician you've spoken to got excited by the fact that a bunch of YouTubers and a bunch of TEDxers yeah. and a bunch of others were involved, that that helped change how they were thinking. I mean, talk, talk about how this thing links in with, with the COP event. So COP is what? It's the con convening of parties? Or it's the, the conference of the parties, conference of the parties who are members of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's the, it's so the key <laughs> meeting. It's that the happened. key meeting at which countries come together. And next year is a particularly big meeting. It's in Glasgow. And the UK is in charge. I mean, whichever party comes out of the election in a couple of days will be in charge of trying to get countries together to reach this big agreement. And they're actually doing great. You know, they are flying in a way kind of under the radar. They're extremely well organized. They have a great strategy of what they want to deliver. And I think they're going to be incredibly successful, um, which is the good news. I also think that they're aware they can't do everything. So we're going to partner with them to deliver this TED so we can take a big piece of the political gain and deliver it in Bergen. Um, the climate negotiations, the media points to them and says, these things need to sort the world out. But in a way, you know, the climate agreement came out of 2015, and now the big outcome, there's some things that need to be negotiated, but the really big game is the level of ambition. So are countries making the ambitious commitments commensurate with the scale of the problem? And some are and some aren't. But really what it's about is not what countries are doing, it's are we stopping putting emissions into the atmosphere? And that's as much about business, it's about citizens, it's about investors, it's about all these other different entities coming together. So what the governments are excited about is that TED can have a different kind of conversation. The, the UK government can't phone up Elon Musk and persuade him to do something significant, but Chris can. And that's a really interesting you know, change in how the world works, right? The authority doesn't reside with governments, it resides with a whole myriad of different entities who are prepared to dream big, and try things that seem unrealistic um, because they know that the outcome is worth fighting for. 
I mean, I know that this sounds big and potentially unlikely, but you have no idea the level of skepticism we faced when we went into the United Nations and said, we're going to deliver a global, universal, ambitious agreement with everybody participating, and we're going to do it in two years. I mean, people thought it was ridiculous. But actually, you get a little bit of spark, you get a little bit of excitement that builds a bit more belief, and people realize we have to do it. Yes, it seems like a long shot, but this is our chance. So we, what do we want to do? Do we want to sit back and feel morose, or do we want to have a go? And once we have a go, then things start moving, and then there's no end to what we can achieve. So I guess our, I mean, our invitation to anyone here uh, listening to this is to um, join the countdown. So there's, there's a website now up at countdown.ted.com. Um, you can sign up. Be part, in the next couple of months, we'll try and connect you with others in Bath or in your company, um, and um, and there's there's a bunch of sort of material about some of the you know causes of emissions and, and all the rest of it that is that is coming on online, and we'd love like 10 10 2020 is an event to which everyone in the world is invited, and you know there's a scenario where we have some very exciting news to re report there, and we would love as many people as possible to uh, to be part of it. <laughs> So look, I hope that you consider this your invitation to get involved. Head to countdown.ted.com to learn more.